get the jacket with the patches on the sleeves, the pipe, and uh, sit back by the fireplace and begin talking with a bit more sophistication when we do these, Mr. Gilstrap. I think we should have a fireplace in the studio. Can you imagine how hot this room would be with a fireplace <laughs> in the studio with all the computers already? Yeah. All right, when we do these author segments, uh, I turn the uh, hosting duties over to John Gilstrap, and uh, you are on the spot right now, sir. I often have the opportunity to introduce authors who happen to also be really good friends, and this is one of them, Mark Cameron. Uh, I don't know, I've known you for about 10 years, I guess, yeah. more or less. We yeah. share a publisher, and um, he has written... 13, 15 books now, I uh, guess. 27. Okay, 27 <laughs> books now. Two. He's, been, he's been doing this for a long time. He's catching up to you. Mark is a retired chief deputy marshal from, he retired in Alaska. Correct. Started your career as, a, well, you grew up in Texas, started your career as a cop in Texas. Yep, yep, and, a patrol and, officer. And then uh, I'll let you tell your, your whole story. But the, one of the parts you have to talk about, your current book is Bad River. Yep which stars a character who is a retired deputy marshal who lives in Texas, in, in uh, Alaska. Go figure. Yeah. And um, Talk about climate swings. <laughs> Texas still I know, Alaska. I know. And um, so he's the real deal. The, you you want to hear people tell war stories. You know, <laughs> cops and firefighters get together and tell war stories. He'll, he'll tell them, sometimes at great length. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I apologize for that. I know, I know, I know, no, no, that was that's so, Mark. Good morning, man. <laughs> he also wrote as Tom Clancy for the Tom Clancy estate. We want to talk about right. that. So welcome. Right. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. This is great. How does a person get a job writing for Tom Clancy? It comes out of the blue. It's like a lightning strike. You don't like like uh, I I actually wanted to write the uh, Bond books a long time ago, and I asked my agent, and she checked into it, and we got the answer back. One does not ask to write. <laughs> bond one is asked to write a bond and it's kind of like that with the Clancy's I, I uh, Mark Graney was stepping away and he had written seven after Clancy passed away and he approached me at a conference that probably the one that I met John at several years ago and um, said hey what are you writing let me give you a cover blurb and then took my manuscript and sent it to Putnam and they called my agent out of the blue and I had a aneurysm <laughs> That is, uh, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, pretty terrifying. My, my, we were doing well. I'd retired, and I was writing another series about a car an OSI agent, Air Force OSI, kind of like NCIS except for the Air Force, which my son um, was doing at the time and doing fine and kind of moving, you know, trying to figure out this whole publishing business. And um, that came in, and I gave my agent probably – I don't know, half a dozen reasons why I shouldn't do it. And she said, Mark, this is Clancy, don't around. And so. Um, Appreciate your self editing there, by the oh, way. That's me. You're good. Yeah. So, how does that, how involved is the Clancy family in developing the plot lines and, and such? N n they, they check them, they just read the synopsis that I send in and then. Uh, um, approve them or not and they've always approved them and I did seven and then stepped back to my own stuff like Mark did I when I told Mark Graney a, a really good guy John knows him as well um, I, I thanked him profusely for this you know bump to my career and he said well we'll see how you feel after two and um, so he did seven I did seven that seems to be it and it's not that it's not a, a great honor and great fun it's just it's just a lot of you, you can't grow the characters like you can your own characters. They are Clancy's characters, and and frankly, I would be mad if somebody mucked around with characters I loved so much. And so, yeah, it's a it's a it's pretty stressful, but great is great the, opportunity. Is the editor in a situation like that uh, with a lot of notes that you're you're le kind of leaving the guide rails here as to what the characters do in the book and not bring this one back a little bit? Yeah, Tom Colgan is a tremendous editor. He's a real writer's editor. The kind of editor that leaves little smiley faces on your manuscript when you do that one good thing and then, and then you know, chops it to pieces. <laughs> but uh, great editor, kept me in. You know, because Clancy had a certain way of writing. And, and then when when we found out we were going to do this for the, for the estate, um, my wife and I uh, put ourselves through kind of a Clancy university and I read one she read a different one and then I would work on the book and then she would read another one and at night she would read one of Mark Graney's to me as I was falling asleep so I could get the kind of where we were in the series today and um, so sometimes I push back or you know he'll say for instance uh, you can't have a, a bad 
police officer in the book, and you know this is about you know positive things, positive law enforcement, positive military, all that. And I'd say, well, in such and such book, Secret Service agent was going to kill him in the White House, and he'd go, okay, leave it, whatever. So it was a very much a two way street. Um, I remember early on we got a note back from the family or one of the attorneys that said, uh, you're making John Clark into a, a bad guy. He's, he's just violent and. I said, okay, let me refer you to Without Remorse, page four yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, there's there's a little scene in there. You know, Clancy was known for writing very long descriptions of technical things, and, and I think he spends a page describing a cable or knife back in Without Remorse. Everybody, you know, we couldn't get away with that now. We're different readers. We have Google. We, you know, we have we've been in a, a you know a war for decades, and so several wars for decades. And so most people know what a cable knife is, at least some kind of fighting knife. And so I kind of put those down and, uh, you know, a little more concise in my descriptions of weaponry, I think. And But uh, I referred him to a spot in Without Remorse where Clance or where Jack Ryan or John Clark um, puts on a poncho, pours it wine all over himself, and he's got this cable knife. And this he's, he's going on revenge for his girlfriend getting killed. And... Um, this drug dealer, he's in Baltimore, and this drug dealer walks by, and Jack Ron, or, uh, John Clark jumps up and stabs him in the belly uh, and out of nowhere. And the drug dealer goes, why Why are you doing this to me? And John Clark goes, practice. And so I referred that to him. He said, okay, here, John Clark's cool. Now, were you writing your own stuff at the same time? So I would write six months. Uh, it took me about seven months to write a, a Clancy and about five months to write one of mine, so I would write two a year. Now, my question is, do you have to kind of write for Clancy in his style? Is it different from your style, or, or is, are you, 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 you're writing a book that you would write just kind of for them? Yeah, you try to stay pure to the characters. Like Clark is, there's some discussion about how old he is. I, I figured he was, in my mind, he was about 68, 67, 68, um, in in real terms, he's much older than that chronologically. I think in real terms, Jack Ryan's been the president for about 26 years in the books. But we just kind of froze time in some ways, and then in some ways, people got older. It's, it's kind of a hodgepodge. But um, I I went with with I went to Tom Colgan, the editor, and and I again I was pretty terrified by this because I I grew up on Tom Clancy and law enforcement. The Hunt for Red October came out when I was in the police academy, and then I can pretty much chart the my career by where I was when the some of I was going to um, protect the judges after the first World Trade Center bombing when some of all fears came out and I was reading it and and uh, on the plane and actually left it on the plane so I had to buy it twice so I remember all these things as I was going along through my career and so I said to Tom Colgan I can't write like Tom Clancy. Nobody can write like Tom Clancy. I mean, I, there was a bit of, not a bit, a lot of hero worship there. And, and he said, don't try. Write the best Mark Cameron book you can in the spirit of Tom Clancy. And it took a huge, huge weight off my shoulders. How accepting has the audience been of the writers since Tom Clancy's last book? Oh, good and bad. I mean, you know, there there are some people that hold that sacrosanct, you know, how dare you steal my thing. Some people think that, me and Mark and Don Bentley and Mike Madden, the people that the other writers that wrote the junior books that uh, you know that were just like ripping off Tom Clancy and it was our thing to go. But we do this for the estate as a write, writers for hire and we're asked by the state the estate to do it. But some people are get grouchy and some, you know, they put you in charge of the early on they would put us in charge of the the Facebook group as the administrators when the when a new book came out and. Some people were really nice, some people were hateful, and some 10-year-old boys would call because they're Ubisoft games or, you know, message it because they're, they're uh, without remorse or Rainbow Six game wasn't working and they wanted you to fix it. So <laughs> everybody's got a problem. But most I don't read my own reviews, so mm -hmm. I, I know that I look to see. I love getting reviews, and I look to see where they're generally trending, but I don't want to know what, what somebody's – what they're thinking mm -hmm. i don't I, if if my editor likes it and my wife likes it and the reviews generally trend above four 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 five something like that then i'm i'm happy if you wrote seven uh, at any point along the way could the clancy family have ended that relationship oh every time yeah every, every uh they could have not accepted my manuscript but we never i didn't have any direct contact 
contact with the Clancy estate. It was all through Tom Colgan and, and Putnam slash Penguin Random House. So I always worked through Tom. But there, everything was very smooth. It was it was a actually just a delightful experience. I just I at some point you have to bet on yourself, and and that that's a right for hire job. You do it. It's done. It doesn't matter if you sell five million copies or you know the movie's made or whatever. That's their that's work product. It's theirs. And I need to think about my future. And, and plus, just creatively, I wanted to write my own characters. I, I you know, I'm. My wife would say um, that I was getting the Jack Ryan flu every July when a book was due because I was grouchy and I was staying up till you know two in the morning and then getting up again at six to write some more. And uh, and not not because they pushed me. It's just it's such a, you know, when you write a, a Clancy, it's going to be in every airport. It's going to go out and you know hundreds of thousands of people are going to read that book and, and write really fat, you know, quickly. Um, and so it was just a lot of probably self-imposed pressure because Tom Colgan was never that way. It was really have, easy. Have you ever been around a discussion about a Clancy book that you wrote without people knowing you were the one who wrote it? Uh, not the discussion, but I've seen people, you know, I was sitting by a guy on the airport and, uh, gosh, it was, it's it's a it's two books ago, but it was maybe two months ago that a guy was reading a book I wrote called Red Winter uh, right next to me, and um, I, w- I didn't talk to him. I didn't want to. I didn't want to know what he thought of the book. He seemed pleased. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Arliss Cutter, your current cra- character. Great. So where does he come from? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm a retired deputy U.S. marshal. Arliss Cutter is a he's a he runs the t- the fugitive task force. The marshals. Um, most of your listeners probably know what marshals do, but if you think of us as the sheriffs of the federal government, um, I like to say when I'm explaining what mar- U.S. marshals do, if you think of the the FBI as the Department of Justice uh, investigative agency, the marshal service or the enforcement agency, we're the ones that, even though we don't work for the courts, we are the, the muscle of the courts. So any document, any warrant, any writ that comes out of the federal courts, um, we're the ones that enforce that. And we're the oldest federal law enforcement agency established by George Washington in 1789. And so we've got a lot of history. I just came from a, a Marshall Service Association um, conference in Savannah. And it was just really cool to, to uh, talk to these. They're all retired. I think I was probably the youngest guy there. But um, just really neat to kind of reacquaint with folks that I haven't seen in a while. But so our history is really deep. Most of the people get in it to hunt fugitives. We get in it because we want to track and hunt and bring the bad guys to justice and um when i moved to alaska i was the uh, i ran the fugitive task force and then as a as what we call a pod plano deputy and uh, then promoted arliss cutter pr- uh, promotes to supervisor to run this task force it just so happens that he his sister-in-law his, his brother dies and there's some extenuating circumstances and some mystery around the death of his brother but um He's had a crush on his sister-in-law since he, they were both 16, and so now he's going back to help his widowed sister-in-law, who he's been in love with for, well, he's 42 now, so decades. And so there's some there's some pressure there, um, but he's really there to help and find out who killed his brother, if his brother was killed, and, and fish out of water, a Florida boy in Alaska, as I, you know, I came from Texas, and it was a um, it was an eye-opening experience, although I always wanted to move there. but So it's fun to write about somebody that, did the same kind of work that I did. He's not, uh, he's way cooler than I am. I, he's got a, in the books, his grandfather, gr- he couldn't say grandpa when he was little. His, gr- his grandfather raised him, and so he always called him grumpy. They both have kind of a mean mug like me, don't smile very often. Um, but my wife, she reminds me all the time, you're not Arliss, you're grumpy. That's, that's who you are. <laughs> and, and grumpy's kind of his muse, right? Yeah, so he and his brother were raised, his mother abandoned him, and, um, his father passed away, and his mother abandoned him when Arliss was five. And so Grumpy, who is a Florida Marine Patrol officer, raised the boys. And so they grew up with this grandfather figure. And incidentally, I, I tell my sons all the time, you know, be think about being your kid's grand, your their grandpa. They call me Papa. But think, think, think about being your kid's Papa because the stuff that I was so wrapped around the axle about when you were growing up to my to my kids, my daughter and my two sons, you grow out of that. I didn't have any impact on that. The big stuff, the the stuff, you know, character things and all that. I didn't need to be so worried about. You guys are turning out good. So they grew up with the 
grandfather figure who taught them to be men. And so now as he's helping his sister-in-law and her kids, he gets some of these grumpy, ca they call them the grumpy man rules. And Dylan, we have a picture of Mark, Grandpa Mark, <laughs> I think, if you could bring that up. This is, this is one of my favorite pictures of it. I actually have this in my phone if I, <laughs> if I ever get like down in the dumps. I think this is one of the, the, for people, it's hard on the radio if you don't see this. This is just Mark in the middle of a snowstorm. It looks really, mm -hmm. really cold. Um, having a bonding moment with his baby grandson is yeah. just, uh, you, don't, nice. you don't look tough at all. Well, there, good, actually. good. I don't feel very tough yeah. there too. <laughs> Probably frozen eyelashes there because he's such a cute, cute. cool little kid. Are you in Alaska there or? Yeah, that's Alaska. That's just out for a walk with my. September? Uh, yeah, 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 in August. <laughs> yeah, we have winter in August. No, that's, uh, it's not particularly cold. We wouldn't take him outside if it was colder than about 10 below. So that's, that's probably, <laughs> well, I mean, they, they have the elementary kids go outside and play until it's colder than 10 below. Um, and 10 below is imminently doable. Your, your skin can keep, keep up with it. It's uncomfortable. But once you're used to it, and he's, he's a tundra tough kid. He's a, he loves it. What town are you in in this picture? Uh, we're just outside of a town called Eagle River where we, where we live. Um, I think that actually that's in a little suburb of even Eagle River is a suburb of Anchorage, and that's up by Chugiak, Alaska, which so is by the high school. You still live there? I do. So you drove in this morning. You left at what time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've been I've been on the road for book tour for Bad River and this conference and a writers conference where John and I linked up in uh, Nashville, and then happened to be here to do some research at the Pentagon in a couple of days, and so this is this perfect timing. It worked out great. Mark Cameron is our guest here on the program in our uh, guest author series, uh, so to speak, that John has arranged for us over the years in the past. He's uh, done writing under uh, Tom Clancy's uh, book series as well, did seven of those as well as writing his own. Matt? So, so, Mark, how do you go from being in law enforcement, reading Tom Clancy books, to saying, now I want to be an author and being good enough at it that you get that invitation? And uh, take me through the transition. You know, that's, that's a great multiple questions and the, the the short answer about getting good at it, at it I guess is that we're always getting better at it we're always learning but I spent so I told my I wanted to write when I was a little boy I started writing my aunt was a librarian and she gave me a a copy she went to a, a, an American Library Association conference and, and this would have been in 1969 or 70 and she got a signed copy of Wilson Rawls Where the Red Fern Grows and so I was she gave it to me when I was eight and I read it and I don't want to spoil it for your listeners but it's a, I tell my grandkids if you buy a book with a dog on the cover you're going to cry it's just sad uh, so I read the book cried my eyes out but then I, I remember distinctly th actually I took it up to my my uh, third grade class and my, I had this huge crush on Miss Whitehead my teacher and she read it and uh, she read it with her collar in her mouth crying, you know, sobbing. <laughs> and I thought, man, I want to I want to write stories about dogs that make pretty girls cry. <laughs> and um, so I spent the next, I don't know, 20, I was eight, so 20-something years writing and getting rejection letters and writing and getting rejection letters. And But when I, when I, my wife's from Calgary, and so we, we lived, and I was in Texas, so we lived quite a ways apart. Uh, um, but uh, I told her before we got married that I want to be a novelist and a theater professor because we met in the theater and uh, she thought that was cool she wanted to, she's a theater major as well and, educ and a teacher and then right before we got married I confessed that I want to be a cop and a novelist and that first year of marriage she gave me a, a um, I got a job as a police officer making six dollars and 67 cents an hour and she somehow scraped the money together to get me a Smith Krona electric typewriter and a ballistic vest and I just wrote and wrote and wrote, and I was, I don't know, I was probably 38 before I got published, so, and then wrote my, wrote westerns, that's why, that's why John didn't know how many books okay. I wrote, because I wrote westerns beforehand under someone else's name, so. Classic westerns, Gunslinger yeah, yeah, for Kensington. Okay. Yeah, so we, we can imagine. Johnstone? Yeah, yeah, well, n maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, that's secret, you can't, Okay. <laughs> So how do you keep pushing through when you're writing and you're sending things out and, and you're not getting the response you wanted to get? You kept writing, though. Yeah, I think it's an illness. It, I didn't, you know, I wanted to get published. I wanted to, and, and I had a couple of offers from, um, back in the day we called them vanity presses or self-publishing, but I had a couple of offers from, offers from people who would 
actually pay half of it. But I just I just had this idea that I wanted to get published, and I, I got published in in Boys Life magazine. Well, I can't remember. I got a short story published in Saturday Evening Post, and then one in the Boys Life or two in Boys Life magazine, and I can't remember which came first. Um, but my wife met me at the door with a check, and, and I knew I was published. It wasn't a surprise, uh, but she met me in the with a check and a rolled up magazine and smacked me on the butt and said, now go right as a couch. This is good. <laughs> we How are, do you find uh, your books real quick? Oh, just um, hold on, Mark. Cause we'll, we'll fit that in in 50 seconds and we, we, we come back the final minute here. We need to get out into the break here and we'll be back with more with Mark Cameron in the final minute next. Mark Cameron, where can we find your books? Well, you can find them on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. My website's markcameronbooks.com. And the book is called? Bad River. And repeat your website again? MarkCameronBooks.com. M-A-R-C. Yep, M-A-R-C-C-A-M. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me. This is great. It's a long drive back to Alaska. From here, if you leave now, you'll be home by October. Yep, I fed the dogs. They're ready to watch. <laughs> Matt, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gilstrap, we see you Thursday. Thursday. Right. Hey, the uh, Dave Ramsey Show is coming up next. This is Talk Radio, WRI Martinsburg and TV 10. And we'll talk with you again in 22 short hours.